All righty, good evening and welcome to the California African American Museum. My name is Alexandra Mitchell and I am the manager of education and public programs here at CAM. For those of us joining you, joining us, excuse me, for the first time, um, I'd like to say a special welcome to the virtual CAM family. Um, I want to extend a special welcome to you. Um, as you may not know, the California African Americans Museum is to research, collect, preserve, and interpret for the enrichment uh, the history, art, and culture of African Americans with an emphasis on California and the Western United States. We were founded in 1977, have a long and rich history as one of the first African American museums of art, history, and culture fully supported by a state. Uh, we have the special privilege of working with and highlighting the artistic, historical, and cultural contributions made by persons of African descent here in the U.S. Um, I'd also like to, of course, say a special thank you to our returning CAM family. I'd like to welcome you back and it's always a pleasure to have you with us. I'd like to extend a deep thank you to our friends and colleagues at Aperture, specifically Emily Stewart and Brendan Emberser for partnering with us this evening for this talk. This evening, as you all know, we're joined to celebrate the work of Mink Smith in her highly poetic and experimental images that are icons of the 20th century African-American life. One of the greatest artist photographers working today, Smith moved to New York in the 1970s and began to make images charged with startling beauty and spiritual energy. The forthcoming book, or should I say the book that's here now, Ming Smith and the Aperture Monograph brings together four decades of Smith's work, celebrating her trademark lyricism, distinctly blurred silhouettes, dynamic street scenes, and deep devotion to theater, music, poetry, and dance. Tonight, we are honored to have Ming in conversation with editor of the monograph, Brendan Embrasser of Aperture, as I mentioned, and contrib uh, contributors, Ixta Murray and Namwali Serpel, as they explore the monograph in Smith's work. The book is co-published by Aperture and Documenting Arts and is available via Esawan Books. We hope you all will purchase that text via Esawan. Um, I know I'll be purchasing my own copy, hopefully to get it signed by Ming in the future. Ming Smith was born in Detroit and raised in Columbus, Ohio. A self-taught artist and former model in the 1970s, she joined the Kamonge Workshop and published her early work in the, new, in the Black Photographer's Annual. Smith is known for her poetic and often experimental meditations on jazz music, African-American communities and cultural icons from Sam Ra and Alvin Ailey to Gordon Parks and Grace Jones. Smith's work has been collected by and presented in major museums, including the Museum of Modern Art, the Whitney Museum of American Art, and the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, Brooklyn Museum, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C., Serpentine Galleries, and the Tate Modern in London, just to name a few. In 2019, Smith's solo exhibition of Jenkins Johnson, uh, sorry, Jenkins Johnson Gallery was awarded the Fries Stand Prize at Fries New York, her work will be featured in the exhibition, working together the photogra photographers, photographers, excuse me, of the Kamonge Workshop, opening on November 21st at the Whitney Museum of, of American Art. Fingers crossed that still gets to open with no COVID interruptions. Smith lives and works in New York. We are also joined, as I mentioned, by Easton Amaya Murray, professor of law at Loyola Law School here in Los Angeles, and author of the forthcoming novel, a novel, Art is Everything. Her work has appeared in Aperture, Art Firm, Glamour, and The New Yorker. She is the recipient of the Whiting Award in American Society of Magazine Editors and Award Fiction. Namwali Sarpal is a Zambian writer and professor of English at Harvard University. She's the author of Seven Molds of Uncertainty, The Old Drift, and Stranger Faces. Tonight's conversation is moderated by Brendan Embrasser, the managing editor of Aperture Magazine. He is the editor of um, the text, as we formerly mentioned, as well as Ethan James Green, a Young New York, Deanna Lawson, an Aperture monograph, and Chloe Du Matthews, Caspian, The Elements, excuse me, and managing editor of Aperture Conversations, 1985 to the present. We invite you to use the question and answer function at the bottom of the screen to engage with tonight's panelists. And with that, I would like to turn the conversation over to Brendan. Great, thank you so much, Alexandra, um, and to everyone at CAM for supporting tonight's program um, and to our public programs manager here at Aperture, um, Emily Stewart. 
it's really a pleasure and a treat to be with you um, and to be with Ming and the um, esteemed contributors to um, Ming's Aperture monograph. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Aperture, Aperture was founded in 1952 by a group of artists, writers, and curators as a common ground for photography. Aperture today is a multi-platform publisher that unites the photography community in print, in person, and online. Uh, Aperture would like to offer deep gratitude and respect to the Lenape people's past, present, and future. We, as an organization, acknowledge that Aperture is on the island known as Manhattan, Manhattan in Lenape Hoking, the Lenape homeland. We would also like to encourage everyone watching to engage and learn from the indigenous communities whose ancestral territories you are currently tuning in from. Through our publications and programs, Aperture is committed to supporting indigenous photographers and artists whose work contributes to dismantling colonial legacies. Ming Smith's Aperture Monograph is co-published by Documentary Arts, a nonprofit foundation based in Dallas and New York. Documentary Arts organizes exhibitions, installations, and public programs with an effort to advance the creativity of artists um, who offer essential perspectives on historical issues and contemporary life. On behalf of Aperture, we extend our deepest and sincerest gratitude to Alan Governor and Kaleta Doolin of Documentary Arts for making this book possible. We also thank our assistant editor, Nicole Achampong, for her creative and immensely important contributions. Our text editors, Elena Gukassian and Susan Sakati, our brilliant designers, Sonia Dyakova and Tom Baber, and especially thanks to Mingus Murray for keeping everyone in line and organizing Ming's archive with an expansive yet precise vision. Ming refers to Mingus as her point guard. Um, and also to the photographer, Chanel Stone, who made a beautiful portrait of Ming uh, for the Aperture Fall 2020 Gala. There are many things that we can do remotely as we've done since March uh, when we temporarily retreated from Aperture's offices in Chelsea, but we still have to put physical objects into the world like this one that we're celebrating tonight. So to that end, we also thank our production team of True Sims, Andrea Chlad, and Freddie Rankin, who put this whole book together under lockdown. There were a lot of phone calls. There were a lot of moments. There were some tears. It was all worth it. And it's amazing that we could put this together. I also gratefully acknowledge the writers, artists, and curators whose advocacy over the years has elevated Ming's work to a place of well-deserved recognition. Um, that includes Deborah Willis, Holland Cotter, and the late Maurice Berger, Rujeko Hockley and Catherine Morris, curators of We Wanted a Revolution, Radical Black Women, 1965 to 1985, which originated at the Brooklyn Museum and traveled to the California African American Museum in 2017. Zoe Whitley and Mark Godfrey, curators of Soul of a Nation, Art in the Age of Black Power at Tate Modern, which traveled to the Brooklyn Museum. And of course, Arthur Jaffa and Hans Ulrich Obrist, who together organized the spectacular solo exhibition of Ming's work within Arthur Jaffa's epic project, a series of utterly improbable yet extraordinary renditions which traveled from London Serpentine Galleries to museums in Berlin, Prague, Stockholm, and Portugal. And of course, we thank you, Ming. Since the 1970s, Ming has made images of startling beauty and power, and this monograph is truly a poetic record of her life and artistic accomplishments. As Angela Davis noted in a powerful talk from San Francisco last night, Frederick Douglass's gift to the future was his voice, the power of his words, which we continue to hear with clarity today. Your gift, Ming, which will long outlast our own lifetimes, is your vision, your way of seeing the world, and your way of picturing the world through the distinct prisms of theater, music, poetry, dance, and spiritual energy. I hope this book will be a kind of passport to the future. It's a message of beauty, not only for our generation, but for generations to come. 
And uh, for those of you who haven't seen the book yet, um, Emily, could we just pull up the first slides? I wanted to give you a little visual tour of the book um, and hopefully you will, it will find its way to your home sometime soon. Um, so these are some pictures of the book. Um, and some of these images we'll be talking about shortly this evening. We are joined tonight by two formidable writers, thanks to Maya Murray, a regular contributor to Aperture magazine, um, and including the Los Angeles issue of the magazine, which we published a few years ago. And Namwali Serpel, um, the author of, among other things, the genius 2019 novel, The Old Drift, put this on your reading list. This is the first edition, and I'm gonna put mine in Mylar for the investment fund. Um, Ming was incredibly generous in thinking about the text contributions um, to this book and together we imagined a wide range of uh, essays by writers both intergenerational and interdisciplinary. We asked each contributor to consider one theme or one keyword and take it from there as their imagination um, went for it. For Nilika Jayawardane, it was Ming's homage to the playwright August Wilson. For Namwali Serpel, Sun Ra. For Emmanuel Aduma, Walking. For Ixta Maya Murray, Beauty. For Arthur Jaffa and Greg Tate, Sound. Uh, this book also includes two intimate interviews with Ming covering her life and career, one by the editor Janet Hill Talbert and one by the curator, Hansel Lord Oberst. And I just have to emphasize how important it is to have primary texts like these for understanding your work now, Ming, and also into the future. And it's just incredibly valuable. And it was so meaningful to work with you on the interviews, especially. Namwali's essay was adapted by the New York Review of Books in July, and Ixtas was published in the New Yorker in September. And we are grateful to both publications for these collaborations which resulted in creating new and wider audiences for Ming's work. So with all of that said, um, we're here to celebrate Ming and to hear from our wonderful contributors. Um, I would like to begin tonight with you, Ixta, um, and start us off with um, ideas about beauty and the female figure, the feminine in Ming's early work, um, both her self-portraits and her portraits of women. And I should say that in your interview with Janet Hill Talbert Ming, you are clear to set the record straight about your early years in New York when you worked as a model to support yourself. You said you were an artist first and throughout your life, many people have jobs. August Wilson was a dishwasher. Um, you were always an artist and not a model turned photographer. And I think we can talk about all those ideas, but I wanted to put that out there first because we had many conversations about it. Um, Ixta, when we first spoke uh, earlier this year about your contribution to the book, I asked you a kind of general question about Ming's modeling tear sheets, which we reproduce in the book, um, and the idea of beauty. And you responded in an email, I don't focus on them in a, gosh, she's so beautiful, wow, isn't this beautiful sort of way. Rather, I'm noticing that her act of offering us these images um, filter through her gaze. She's acting as a conceptualist and adding a race conscious element to that gesture. Her photography and her archiving are these gigantic artistic acts that deserve attention. So Emily, could we pull up Ixta's slides and Ixta, could you begin um, with Ming's self-portrait and yes. take us through ideas about beauty? I'm so thrilled to be here. Um, thank you, Brendan. Thank you, Aperture. Thank you, Cam. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Um, uh, it is a great honor to speak about this body of work. Um, so what I'm there, Ms. Smith's importance as a photographer exists among many dimensions. Um, what I'm going to focus on is uh, what has been described, of, uh, described as beauty. But I think about it I think about her work and the photographs that I'm going to talk about tonight um, as conveying and documenting uh, Ms. Smith's and other black women's creation of themselves through gestures that are made potent by their vision, their willpower, 
and their ability to reimagine and reclaim the world around them, an imperfect world. And so we begin with uh, this iconic image, Self-Portrait 1988, which is uh, boundary breaking in so many different ways. Uh, we see the, that there are colors within the colors, within the black and white, there are shades and energies uh, even within a limited palette. We see Ms. Smith kind of bending backwards a little bit, uh, looking off, off camera, um, her head slightly thrown back. It is a transported image. It is a beautiful image. Uh, but the thing that strikes me so importantly in this image is her left hand clutching that camera. So you see how her fingers uh, of both, of both hands are, are, are operating so strenuously, but that the hand clutching uh, her, her, I believe, her cannon is uh, showing the ferocity of the artistic process, um, what it takes uh, to be uh, a woman of color, a black woman photographer in the United States in the 1980s, the 1990s, uh, the 2000s now. And um, so that is, it, that image, that, that part of the, of the photograph brings it uh, for me into the realm of the highest art. And that we can also talk about Grace Jones. There's an image of Grace Jones within her body of work. I don't know if we can turn to that for a second. Uh, well, we can, I, I'd like, if, it, if possible, I'd rather talk about the tear sheets at the end, but I, uh, I can move to that, great. So Grace Jones. Um, uh, a master performer, a uh, dancer, a singer. Uh, what we see here is another image of a, a woman uh, opening herself up to the world, uh, but also engaging uh, glamour as a power source, um, as a force of creativity. And she surrounds herself with this constellation of light. So this is a conversation between uh, Ms. Jones and Ms. Smith, uh, the synergy, the, the, the communion between them is visible in the product of this photograph. And I always think she's like a sun around which the other planets are revolving, and this, this kind of stream of stars. And uh, she's, she's a creator. Both, both women are creating uh, themselves and this image in such a powerful way. And then the image of Judith Jameson is another uh, important part. So I'm gonna talk about Tina, Tina Turner in just a second. I don't know if we can get, yeah. So Judith Jameson um, is famous. Uh, she's, she danced with Alvin Ailey and she uh, is the head of uh, the Jameson Project. She is world famous for her ability to um, kind of explode around the creative center, right? Her, her creative center of her, of her middle. And she, she has these talkative hands and these flinging limbs and she moves through space when she dances. But in this image, uh, Ms. Smith shows us that, this, uh, that, um, that Judith Jameson is able to achieve the same kind of kineticism, the same kind of uh, forcefulness, even when she is still, even within stillness. And we see that there's a lot going on here. There's a little bit of a contraposto. Um, we have these, 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 an, these hands coming together at the hips, forming these, this beautiful line. And then there are the eyes, right, with so much energy and uh, so, much, so much soul uh, that, that we are magnetized by it. And then with Tina Turner, uh, we have a person uh, who is also evidently in a moment of repose, but we can feel her and see her thinking. We can see her taking this moment to have a deep thought. Uh, at this moment, she at this moment in her career, I believe she was a major superstar and surrounded by so much sound, so much action, and so much noise. And I always I always think about how Miss Smith must have must have known how to wait for the moment, right? To, to know not to, to know how to wait until Tina Turner 
was able to show us this different face. So there are these, these images we have of Ms. Smith, of Tina Turner, of Judith Jameson, Grace Jones, which are beautiful. Certainly these are images of beautiful women, but they're also images of power and creation and self-creation. Um, but Ms. Smith also um, is able to uh, not only achieve these feats through portraiture, but also through a very intriguing act of, uh, uh, in the archive. So it's, it's here that I'm hoping we can turn, for example, to um, perhaps Revlon Group, uh, where we see, um, right, this uh, pr rather conventional image of uh, three women posing uh, for um, a cosmetic company. And, um, you know, we were made to wonder about um, capitalism and, uh, you know, all the problematic issues of, of, of beauty in our society. Um, but Ms. Smith, when she, when she archives these tear sheets, and I think some of them I saw even evidence that they had, some of them had once been wrinkled and that she had taken the care to smooth them out. And I, the evidence of her hand there was so powerful to me. But when she, when she archives them and then re-delivers them to us, pregnant, imbued, fragrant with her gaze, they become an entirely different object. They become uh, an, art, an art form. Um, and moreover, moving to green dress, uh, green dress is a very complicated image. We see here um, a woman with Miss Smith in a classical uh, pose, conveying her, her majesty, her beauty, her seductiveness. And um, uh, what, what we are struck by, I, what I'm struck by in particular is the use of color. She's wearing a green devore burned uh, velvet dress with this, this green, this, this green color kind of flowing through in a stargazer lily and we have the white uh, satin sheet uh, behind her. And what's, what's so interesting about this is that when Ms. Smith re-presents re this um, as an archive art, I don't, that may be one way of describing it, um, we're also made to remember that when this image was taken, I believe it was 1973, mid-1970s, there was a certain form of color prejudice within the world, within the art world when it came to photography. So in 1976, William Eggleston, as I think a lot of us might know, had a now famous uh, color photograph show at MoMA, which was one of the first shows, uh, one of the when I guess one of the first big shows showing color photography. And it was panned by the New York Times as being boring. And color within photography was uh, suspect as a, and, and, and excluded from the realm of high art. And uh, Ms. Smith's reintroduction of this image makes us think about color prejudice in lots of different ways. Um, to be a colorist, uh, as she is when she gives us this image back, uh, to be the subject or object of photography and to be a photographer and a black woman is in, in the words of uh, Nikki Giovanni, a metaphysical dilemma. And, uh, and it's, it's such a joy. It's such a joy to us. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, there, there you have it. Um, <laughs> Ming, to turn to you and not to dwell too much on um, your modeling work, but I did want to ask you when you were a young person coming to New York um, in the 1970s, you were in front of the camera and you were behind the camera. And I wondered about um, if the modeling work and your work with other artists was a type of education, like uh, an education in how to see and how to be seen. I think I, was like an actor that would go on stage when I was photographing. Uh, I mean, when I was modeling. And then I, when I came home, uh, I would wash off all the makeup and put my hair in a bun and go to my work clothes, which was jeans and a t-shirt. And, and I, 
I was at home in that world. But it was like going on stage and then getting off stage. It was part of doing a job. I many times I had criticism. They would say, like, you're a model. You're, you know, you shouldn't go around looking like that. <laughs> but uh, I'm still that way. I'd like to, you know, come out and be the actress or be the person that's on and then take off the makeup and take off the clothes and be, um, be myself, be within the comfort in being by myself or in touch with myself. You're, Ming, do you think your experience um, as someone who worked in that industry gave you a kind of sensitivity or empathy when you were photographing the um, figures that Easton spoke about, like Judith Jameson or Tina Turner? I mean, did you have a sense of how to shape their photographic images because you already had, you were on the other side of the equation? So many times when I was photographing, they would have been playing other roles. Like t we were doing a video uh, at the Tina Turner, What's Love Got to Do With It? But when she, I caught Tina, she was in her like off moment, not her on moment. And uh, I, I, I guess more of as an artist, because I was photographing her as an artist, not being like part of the crew or being, you know, on stage. I was like behind the scenes. There was a connection. And with, I, I just realized this now from looking at those four uh, women there was a moment where we gave to each other. There was a silent exchange. It was like, uh, it was, uh, you know, information. Like, uh, it was just a, a real moment between us. And I think in those uh, photographs that were shown, that's what was happening. Because I, um, Judith Jameson had done, I was, that was an assignment with Judith Jameson, uh, sophisticated ladies. And so that's very campy, sophisticated ladies. Um, Phyllis Hyman was one of them. Also Mercedes Ellington, she was the tap in this. But this was a moment off stage. So I caught that off stage. My eye, because I had modeled, but also um, because I was an artist, I captured, you know, the composition, everything. I just, you know, I waited for the moment and like I placed them there. Tina was already there, but so I, those were just elements that I knew, you know, as being a photographer and um, they looked good and it was a moment that I wanted, you know, to capture and so, and you do so beautifully. Um, I mean, as I said, as, and you do, and you do it so beautifully. Um, I mean, as Greg Tate notes um, in his, uh, this is the music critic Greg Tate in his conversation for the book, you garnered a series of firsts, um, the first and only member of the Kaminge Workshop for Black Photographers, which was founded by Roy Zakharava, um, and will be the subject of a Whitney exhibition coming soon. Um, and the first black woman photographer to have her work purchased for MoMA's collection here in New York. This was in 1975. Um, as someone very famously said last Saturday, while I may be the first, I will not be the last. Which is certainly true um, to take MoMA's collection of photography as just one example, which now of course includes works by Dina Lawson, uh, Carrie Mae Weems, and many other black women photographers. But sometimes you don't know that you're a first or you don't feel like a first when it happens, you realize it later on. So I just wondered if you could take us back to those years um, when you first came to New York and how did you find your way into these creative groups? On the one hand, the models uh, that you knew, the artists, the hairdressers, but also the uh, members of the Kamenge workshop and yeah could you tell us a little bit about those formative moments coming to new york i was seeking i wasn't sure uh, what i was seeking but besides earning a living there was something else that i was seeking i mean i love dance i 
tried to dance in when as a young girl, but they did not admit black girls to this dance school. Uh, so I had maybe dreams of like coming to New York to dance and I heard about all this this creative energy. But my first was to survive, to survive. But not only just financially, also from uh, people that would say, oh, don't go to New York. It's a big place. You know, you'll get caught up. If you don't succeed, you'll be all of this negative energy. And that had a lot to do with coming to New York. But I do feel that it was a, I was on a spiritual path. And I know that I was, and because things came to me, I was, you know, going for one reason, but something else, I, and it's been happening all my life, and I can see it. And so I finally, at this age, know that I was on a spiritual path, and I'm still on that path. But I'm thinking also, that's beautiful, and thank you um, for sharing that, but I was also thinking about some of the moments that um, must have been so exciting for you, such as when you um, presented your work at um, a hair salon and everyone was lining up to see the exhibition. Can you, talk, can you tell that story for us? Well, during my journey, there were top moments of validation and that gave me strength to continue, which was like immense for me. Uh, as um, there was a, something I want to ask. Well, you, when you say like first photographer that was in MoMA or first in Kamangi, I honestly didn't really think about it in that way. Maybe because there was no real monetary success. And I thought of myself as an artist. I have a way of being in a group and disappearing. Like people say, oh, I forgot you, you're so quiet. I didn't even know you were still here. Um, so, be, and being a shy person, uh, I could hide or just in a way be in any environment and just kind of hide or disappear. Um, but having those validations was what, you know, gave me uh, strength. But it was like receiving an Academy Award and no one knowing about it. And the few people that did know about it, forget it. They didn't like me at all. They didn't like me at all. They didn't even want to see me. So I knew not to even, you know, say that to too many people because, <laughs> I mean, that's the honest truth about it. Um, but on a modeling assignment, for example, when I say spiritual path, I went to show my portfolio because you would have tests. You would go to different studios. They'd give you a list of modeling agency and you'd go and you would set up an appointment to show your book or show you, even if you had only two photographs, to see if the photographer wanted to photograph you for his portfolio. And, and that's what you wanted because you could get photos to build up your portfolio to eventually go to an ad agency. Uh, so they would book you. So I was waiting in the foyer of uh, Barbosa studio uh, because I, when I first met him, he was a fashion photographer. This is um, Anthony Barboza, right? Yes. In, also in a member of Kamangi. Yeah. And I heard these two photographers talking uh, about was it an art form or not. One was saying, I remember vividly that, um, and I couldn't see the faces, that um, he was saying, look, no, it's all nostalgia. And the other one said, no. So it, it was this conversation, but I had been photographing, but I didn't consider myself a photographer. I didn't really even know anything about photography as an art form. Although I took photographs just like a, 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 a street photography. I was doing street photography without even knowing because I had gone to my instructor at Howard and he said you could only photograph machines, machinery or medical. And, th and those two didn't um, interest me. And they didn't have a big uh, photography um, uh, program there. It was only one class and it was an elective. But I did use a Roly and I took 
maybe a hundred rolls of film that I've never seen because I gave it to someone who was going to process it for me. And I don't know, life went on and those roles, <laughs> I don't know what had happened to them, but that's how I've, you know, Komangi, it uh, introduced me to photography as an art form. And that's huge for me because then I, I went to the different uh, bookstores. I loved bookstores and I would go to one A Street bookstore and look at all the photography books and, you know, but I love painters as well. I, I love artists, you know, the different writers. And um, that was the beginning. Mm -hmm. I met Grace Jones because she called me and told me she had just come from Paris and she's going to be uh, dancing or performing at Studio 54 and to come take photographs because she knew I was a photographer. You know, I, I the photograph, I guess it's in the book at Sinandra's that was taken before she went to Paris. And she had doubts, you know, all well, we young artists, she didn't know, you know, she didn't really have money. She had doubts, she, you know, back then we all dealt with, you know, black girls, they were either too dark or too light or you know it was just all these things that we still deal with you know your hair you shouldn't my photograph that's in the book uh, my agent said that i looked like i was a care baby and i was begging uh and that i should not even go to paris because they wouldn't you know accept me or like me and you know i went anyway because i knew grace was over there and <laughs> so just that was just part of my um my journey. Well, Ming, you evoke a lot of those stories and that time period um, beautifully in your interviews um, for the book. And for the viewers out there, I want to underscore the importance of um, the reemergence in mainstream institutions of um, Kaminge, both the exhibition that's upcoming at the Whitney and um, the renewed interest in the Black Photographers Annual, which was a publication um, of Black photographers many who were in Kaminge um, in the 1970s, and it's beautifully reproduced. There were four issues. Ming is one of the highlights of the artistic students in Black Photographer's Annual. And that, in my sense of that, it really evolved in part because magazines like Aperture didn't have a track record that was good in terms of publishing artists of color at that time. And um, this other magazine arose to fill that space. and um, it that moment is very important and I think that also the um, the acquisition of Louis Draper's archive at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts and the digitization of that archive is just of immense importance to understanding the role of photography in the 1970s and in the community in which you were um, living and working. I want to turn now to um, Namwali um, who writes in part about Sun Ra um, for Ming's book. But when I say that with some hesitation, it's only because it's a work of such staggering um, scholarship and poetic um, flights of fancy from one um, medium, poetry, drama, film, um, all the way up to Ming's own images. Um, it was a joy to work with you on this um, Namwali. And I wanted to ask if you could just take us through a little bit of background with Sun Ra and tell us maybe to start who Black Herman is. Sure, so um, thank you so much uh, for having me. And it's, it was such an honor to write about um, Ming's work. I, um, something I've noticed that we've been talking about so far is what it means to create yourself uh, from a standpoint of being a black person in America, which is so often a kind of ground zero. Um, there's so much negativity, um, as, as Ming said earlier, and a lot of my piece is about how I think Ming's photography captures the oscillation between nothingness, darkness, negativity, and light um, and what that, uh, she, she, she talks about it as a kind of uh, improvisation with light. So I, I'm just gonna 
read this quote uh, from her interview at the start of the book. Um, Dealing with light is the main focus and attraction. I do a lot of night shooting and even in the dark, I look for the light, the way the light comes in. In all my work, I improvise with light, with what's there. I feel my way through things and I let the spirit guide me. It's such a beautiful articulation of what spirit is, which is conjuring something out of nothing. So uh, I start my piece by talking about Black Herman, who uh, was a vaudeville stage magician. Um, he, his original name was Benjamin Rucker, and uh, he was the most prominent African-American magician of his time um, in, the, in the early 20th century. Uh, and he learned the art of staged illusions from a performer called Prince Herman. So this tradition goes even further back into the late 19th century. And his among Black Herman's tricks were levitation, um, rabbit conjure, um, and escape acts. And, uh, but his most famous uh, act was a kind of um, blasphemous miracle. He would be buried uh, in Black Herman's private graveyard and then exhumed uh, three days later. And this was such a popular act of his that when he did actually die, no one believed that he had died. They thought he was about to be, um, he was about to resurrect. Um, so the, uh, I start with Black Herman because a woman named uh, Ida Blount, uh, who's a waitress in Birmingham, Alabama, loved Black Herman loved his magic tricks and so she named her son um, Herman Poole Blount after after this magician um, and uh, you know Herman's nickname was Sonny um, and he uh, was a musical prodigy um, and I describe how he was kind of on his way to be, to to um, uh, get a scholarship uh, to study music education at Alabama State Agricultural and Mechanical Institute uh, when he had a vision. Um, and this, um, in this vision, you'll see that there's um, pieces of, of light and darkness again. Um, so he described it this way. These spacemen contacted me. They wanted me to go to outer space with them. I'd have to go up with no part of my body touching outside of the beam. It looked like a giant spotlight shining down on me. And I call it transmolecularization my whole body changed into something else. I could see through myself. And this aspect of, uh, of light and, and invisibility also is something I see emerging um, in, in Ming's photographs of the person who would become uh, Sun Ra. So Herman Blount, uh, Sun, Sunny Blount, eventually changed his name um, to, to uh, Sun Ra. Uh, he said that Herman Blount was a slave name. Uh, so he, he even renounced his magical roots himself. So um, if we could go to the next slide. So this is a, um, a, a still image from uh, a film called Space is the Place uh, from 1974, uh, in which Sun Ra reenacts this uh, space travel vision that he had when he was a young man. And the premise of the film is that he, He's going to transmolecularize um, everyone to, uh, to Saturn. Uh, he wants to set up a colony for Black people, um, and he wanted to teleport them there. And um, this film from 1974 is often considered the kind of uh, Ur text or origin text for what we now know as, as Afrofuturism. My sense of it is that Afrofuturism it has a much longer history, um, but whenever people talk about Afrofuturism as a movement, they, they think about, about Sun Ra because he brought this, uh, he connected the Black experience um, in America to uh, the Black matter of outer space uh, in a very direct way, right? Because he had this, um, this vision. And something that's, I think, really important to note um, in creating himself, in self-naming and self-creating and associating himself with outer space, um, Sun Ra never broke character. He never uh, said, oh, this is just a joke or this is just my art. 
he, he genuinely seemed to um, believe this, so much so that uh, when I published this article in the New York Review of Books, I got some emails from, um, from various people, including a doctor who said that he was brought into a medical room and they were like, this guy keeps saying that he's not from planet Earth and we don't know what to do with him and it was Sun Ra. <laughs> so even, even faced with, with trying to get um, medical uh, assistance, he stuck to this. And I think it, what really interests me about this is the way he describes the mythological quality and futuristic quality to his persona in terms of nothingness and somethingness, in terms of dark and light. Um, and this is the, the kind of oscillation or shimmering between absence and presence that I think um, Ming so beautifully captures. So he says in Space is the Place, he's talking to uh, a bunch of um, youths at a youth center and he says, I'm not real. I'm just like you. You don't exist in this society. If you did, your people wouldn't be seeking equal rights. You're not real. If you were, you'd have some status among the nations of the world. So we're both myths. I do not come to you as a reality. I come to you as the myth, because that's what Black people are, myths. And I think the way that he captures this, again, is by constantly moving back and forth between I exist, I don't exist, I exist, I don't exist. So um, if we go through some of the next photographs, this, this is the sort of um, normal way that we see uh, Sun Ra photographs. So we get pictures of the orchestra, uh, which is his um, avant-garde band. This is from the Detroit Jazz Center uh, in 1979. And it was photographed by Lenny Sinclair. He's an American photographer. Um, radical political activist. She, she was one of the founders of the White Panther Party, which was an, an anti-racist group. Um, but the, you, you get this sense of we're, we're, it's an eclectic group of people. Um, a lot of it, a lot of the focus for Sun Ra um, in photography has been on the hybridity um, and the kind of um, uh, heuristic um, costuming that often invokes Africa but also outer space. And so you get this kind of like chaotic clutter and it's a, a, lot, a lot about the kind of um, psychedelic hybridity. So if you go to the next slide, these are um, the covers of the albums, um, some of which were made by Sun Ra himself who did wood blocking um, and some of which were made by um, uh, an amateur graphic designer um, uh, named Claude and and then also Aie Aton um, did some of the design work for these. So if you go to the next slide, this is um, a, a, a first edition of Sun Ra's Book of Poetry. And I quote some poetry um, in, in my essay because again, there's a lot of uh, interest in darkness and light and in how you can make something out of nothing. So lines like, out of nowhere they come like embers suddenly aflame out of nowhere they come from the no point. So there's all this um, uh, balance of, of, of lightness and dark. Um, and again, this is designed by Aya Aton. Um, so you can see like the, the general vibe that we get when we think about Sun Ra. And if you go to the next slide, this is the Rolling Stone cover from 1969 by Baron Woolman, who took lots of photographs of, um, of musicians. Um, you get the kind of eyes wide shut psychedelic thing going here. Um, he's, he's like treated as a kind of guru with the orchestra as this collective. And I think this manages to, to capture maybe like the popular conception of Sun Ra, like the studium. But when we're thinking about the actual spirit uh, of Sun Ra, I think this is where Ming's photographs um, really do something that I had not seen before um, in my work on, on Afrofuturism which is to capture this oscillation between darkness and light. Um, so if we could go to the, the, the photographs, I mean, it's just an incredible capturing of spirit. Um, you feel Sun Ra here in a way that I think you don't in some of these other photographs, which are more steady, uh, straightforward, um, and, but also kind of blind to um, the, the movement um, of this person, the energy. And 
it's it's interesting to think about these photographs in relation to that that photograph of Grace Jones, right? Again, a constellation of light around um, the central figure who is enigmatic but has so much um, energy pouring out of them, even with sunglasses on. Um, so this kind of syncopation of light and dark, the atomizing of of light and dark, um, the invocation of of outer space um, is something that I think we see in, in Ming's photographs. Um, and this is a, a photograph of Pharaoh Sanders, where again, we see light and dark kind of stuttering, um, almost um, like uh, acid trails. But again, this is to me captures the spirit way more than if we were to actually have the kind of hyper color of, of acid trails. There's something so much more delicate and, um, but also attuned to what Ming calls you know, the moment when she's taking photographs. Um, when I'm shooting, I have this sense, this is the photograph I'm going to print. This is the moment. I kind of always sense that. And that to me is very much about how she's capturing spirit very often in movement um, uh, and in moment. So yeah, my, my piece really was, was trying to think about how um, the qualities in Ming's photographs, the vanishing quality, um, the presence and absence that is felt in a photograph like Invisible Man, this idea that Black art so often is about an oscillation between negation and presence, and how that gets captured in music, in the skittering of, of notes in Sun Ra, um, but also in his poetry um, and in his, uh, in his film and in his, in his music. Um, and I think is, is really one of the most uh, striking aspects of, of Ming's photographs for me is um, how, the, how it manages to capture not, uh, not, not kind of reifying or making statues out of these amazing figures like Tina Turner or like Grace Jones or like Sun Ra, but capturing their spirit, capturing them in motion, capturing them um, as they shimmer. Well, thank you for that um, really beautiful evocation and exploration. Um, you mentioned Namal in your essay, um, a quote from Greg Tate um, from his conversation, um, this idea of the visual trill, which I think is so beautiful. And when I see that Pharaoh Sanders image, I think of that, um, the, it's a little bit like a de Carava, but it's very Ming Smith in its delicacy and its elegance. And the, um, what you just said, the stutter or the lines of the black and white the saxophone, the delicate movement um, is, is exquisite. So thank you for that. Um, I wanted to turn um, back to Ixta and I guess to all three of you to ask um, an idea about, um, about Ming's um, ascendance um, at this moment um, in the last few years through a lot of amazing curatorial work um, through writing and why it is that um, we're so ready for these pictures again and to really think about not only Ming's career but the career of many um, Black women artists and Black artists who have been at it for decades and who now are kind of as Catherine Morris and Rue Hockley write in um, We Wanted the Revolution are um, seeking their place in the sun. And Ixta, you conclude your um, essay um, in the book and also in the New Yorker um, by saying that Ming's remarkable body of work belongs in the canon for its wealth of ideas and for its preservation of black women's lives during an age not unlike today when nothing could be taken for granted. And it's, it's auspicious our gathering this evening after the election of the first woman of color to what is what you can imagine is what the most second most powerful position of power you know second most powerful position in the world and that ascendance to which Kamala Harris um, gratefully acknowledged the contributions of black women at the podium and I was thinking about that um, in advance of tonight's um, gathering could you say to more about the trajectory that we might imagine um, from the 1970s to now and um, why it's important to remember 
um, the spaces that Ming was showing her work at in the 1970s, and that just because um, she is showing at the Tate and Serpentine and the Whitney doesn't mean that we, have, we can now forget the struggles and the years um, outside of the headlines. So can you take us through a little bit of that? That's not too complicated. Of well, course. so when you, when you talk about a trajectory and an ascension into, I guess, from a lower place to a higher place, that's where, that's where I wonder about, well, first of all, that this, this ascension has happened because of the vision and hard work of many curators and Ms. Smith and her community. I mean, that is, that is an, and, and uh, uh, throwing themselves against these obstacles until they began to creak and break. But um, I, I think that, that her work has always been avidly understood as spectacular um, throughout this entire period. Um, so what we have now is um, uh, a museum uh, industry and gallery industry that is now recognizing her. And that is fantastic and we rejoice. Um, and that is all of a piece with the vision of the first gallerist, the first hair salon owner who saw, right, who saw her work and said, I'm, this, is, this belongs up on the wall so that everybody can see it. And so um, we are made to share now, it brings, us into, it brings her work into a larger community who are made to share in those initial moments of revelation. She's always, always deserved this. And uh, it's great that more people can see her now, but it really, you're right to focus on those, those, those first curators, those, those first uh, folks who began to show her work. They were the ones uh, who knew and led the way. Yes, exactly like Linda Good Bryant um, and of, of the Just Above Midtown Gallery, which Ming speaks about. And thank you for that correction to the metaphor. Ascension, you're right, is not the right. I'm not, uh, I don't intend to correct you. I'm just, no, just wondering. I, it's more like um, turning on more lights, shining more lights and focusing those lights. And so you're right, there's, it's not a up or down trajectory. It's, a, it's more of a way of seeing um, in the culture. So thank you for that. Um, Ming, I wanted to, um, before we kind of open up for some questions from our audience tonight, I wanted to ask you a question about survival, which is a word that I noted while we worked on the book and also others tonight have brought it up and you use this word frequently. Um, and I was very moved not only to read again, but in the times that we were editing and finishing the book, um, I was very moved to read the last lines of your conversation with Janet Talbert about how you sometimes felt that no one understood you as a child when you were growing up in Columbus. You were a daydreamer. You loved school. Um, school was a way of an escape in some ways. You had a really cool aunt um, who taught you about the blues. Um, but you still were seeking um, a form of transcendence. So I just wondered if you could talk to us about survival and, and transcendence, which I imagine has been a consistent um, theme in your work these years. I'm still in the work and through the pandemic and everything else is the work has helped me survive everything. I mean, I was not thinking about the pandemic. I was thinking about getting images. So again, it's like staying in the art, staying in the work. And that's what has made me um, consistent. And um, it, it gave me purpose. Uh, it, the purpose was bigger than myself. 
so with those um, uh, aspirations or with those uh, sense of purpose that's helped me survive everything. Uh, uh, Nina Simone, she has this, and I liked, she said, uh, what kept me sane was knowing that things would change. And it was a question of keeping myself together until they did. And when I mean a sense of purpose, she also said something about, um, there's no excuse for the young people not knowing who the heroes and heroines are or were. And so like just today hearing you talk about Sun Ra, I mean, when I went to see Sun Ra, I went because my girlfriend wanted to audition for his band. She was a friend. So that's why I went. I didn't go because it was Sun Ra, you know, it was because I was giving support and to, you know, and I, I love dance and, and so she went and she went on the trip. And it's interesting because I couldn't remember what, uh, where the theater was or what it wasn't. Everyone kept on saying it was this and that, but it was the squat. And the squat theater was a, a Hungarian experimental theater group. And they had a stage. So they allowed Sun Ra to have a concert there. It wasn't maybe 30 people at the most in the audience. And so it, it, I'm saying also he wasn't like Sun Ra. It was like, no, it was, he, he wasn't playing at the big places where Miles Davis or Dexter Gordon or even Betty Carter. It was like some small theater group that allowed him to perform. And I was there to support my friend who eventually did dance with Sun Ra. And also I wanted to say that so you did research on Sun Ra. So the younger ones know Sun Ra. These photographs for me is like, I'm so glad that I did this work because I can pass it on. Someone could take one person in my book and write an entire book about say Tina Turner. When I photographed her, she, this was her first song that she came out without Ike. So this was, she was on going through, you know, very female type of, female type of issues, you know, that, you know, people are going through there. Uh, you know, when Grace came, it was, she called me because we talked about her not feeling, belonging anywhere or, you know, going into new territory. And, and even me, I had uh, people, I knew over in Paris and they were like, they didn't, they talked about me. I remember on my birthday, I was crying because they were saying, well, what kind of person are you to like, you know, it's so, they, these are issues, but the young can look and they can learn about their lives and find strength in just knowing that these people existed. The same way when I read uh, Catherine Dunham or Nina Simone or you know, um, people like, Josephine Baker. I, I love these women. Yeah, I was gonna, I wanted to say earlier that um, I think um, what strikes me about your work and about Sun Ra and Grace Jones and Nina Simone, and I don't mean, I don't mean this in a negative way at all because I count myself among you, that you're all artist weirdos. Like you're not, you know, you're not like grand, you know, like you say, he was just in a Hungarian basement doing his thing. And, and you know, a lot of the orchestra did not get paid. They did not have any money at all. And, and Sun Ra would be like, I don't have anything to give you except my art. And so that network of, of people just making art, I actually think is where the Overton window has shifted for recognition. So it's not grand achievement. It's just you were always an artist like when you re like the, there's a photograph in here you took in like high school and you were just always an artist you were always an artist and that to me is like that freedom for black people and black women in particular to just be artists and not have to be icons 
is actually what is, I, I think, extraordinary about this moment, that we can actually just see your art. Thank you. Amazing. Ming, one of the questions um, from the audience is, um, how much of literature has shaped your work? And this is a wonderful question because um, Namwali only gets it one strand at all of the literary references and ideas that um, populate your vision and your way of thinking. And um, we have a whole essay in the book devoted to August Wilson. So maybe you, I know in Paul, Lawrence Dunbar was important to you as a child, but I guess, do you want to say a few words about some of the key literary figures who shaped your, your thinking? I think artists in general, because painters, artists, I mean, uh, writers, but of course, uh, so something happened to me when I was like around 13. I would, very few books I, I would, I would read, you know, finish. I would read maybe the first chapter or something and just, you know, part of it. And I would be so inspired. I would start doing things. I couldn't finish the book because just one line just opened up, a, you know, a, a flood of wanting to create. I, you know, so that happened when I was very, very young. I was a perfect reader. And, and my father was a fervent reader. And I remember Pearl Buck, um, um, what's the name of her mate? Pearl's book is like, oh, and I can't remember. It's my first book that I read. It was a novel. And, um, but of course, like August Wilson, I saw the play, uh, Two Trains Running. I had seen one before, uh, Ma Rainey Come and Gone. But when I said that, I knew those characters. Yeah. So I, hmm? the good earth. yeah, the good earth that is. And I love those characters. Like I didn't want the book to end and I read that. And this was when I was very young. I was in fifth grade, I think. And, um, but so when I saw the play of, um, of August Wilson, and, you know, it inspired me. I knew these different characters. I, I, I felt them like, in the book, I tell her about the Hambone kid, you know, with my father, and he was like that. And it was about it was about culture. It was about community and court culture. And my father valued it. I mean, he valued it. He loved um, Aida's and Leotine Price's Aida and uh, Connie Francis. But he he loved street people. He just loved, you know, people and culture, and he valued it. And at a young age, I didn't really, um, you know, just because of the way someone dressed or, you know, they might look. I, I remember when I came to New York, there was a guy and he looked, he like, looked like a bum. He was like walking across the, in, in uh, it was in Soho, in the Bowery, and there was the Bowery. And someone says, this is one of the most brilliant musicians that ever lived. But he didn't make it. He, he did make it as far as a living. I don't know what happened, but I remember seeing him. And I also remember stories about actors who had told me about this brilliant, brilliant uh, black male actor that was brilliant. He was like a genius and he was a cook. He didn't make it as an artist. And so I, I, value, I value people and it's not always, you know, the rich and the famous, but I, everyday people, there's so much beauty, you know, in Harlem, sometimes you hear, you know, just words on the street like this, like, uh, like, uh, I think Quincy Troop said, this one guy was like, gee, I can't pickpocket now because of this uh, coronavirus, you know, I thought that was hilarious <laughs> that he said that, or, uh, you know, you know, just the poetry that they can say going, this is, oh, let, hey, Red, let's go to bed. I mean, it's just, it's, it's I don't know, it's this, uh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. I, I wonder if just this one thing to make, maybe make sense of what I'm trying to say. One of my favorite quotes by Albert Murray um, from, it's Albert Murray's book is The Omni-Americans, Black Experience and the American Culture. 
Human nature is no less complex and fascinating for being encased in dark skin. Blacks have produced the most complicated culture and therefore the most complicated sensibility in the Western world. I think this was like a feeling this way. This was the motivation for me to do my work. Ming, I wanted to um, ask you about one image that's in the book. It was a sort of a discovery when we were editing it. Emily, could you um, pull up the last of the slides quickly? Um, uh, and then you can, can you advance two slides, please? One more. One more after this, yeah. So this image, Ming, um, was in 1976, I believe. And when it came to us, um, it was called Paris Street Fair. Uh, but mm -hmm. as we finished the book and we finished all of the captions, you renamed it Social Distancing Paris. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I found that so witty and <laughs> poignant. And you said, everyone will know when this book was made. It was absolutely. <laughs> and the circumstances around <laughs> it. <laughs> exactly. But was this a moment of serendipity that you were on the street and you saw this? Or were yeah. you, can you tell us? It was Paris. It was Paris. It was you know, Europe, I love black and white films. I love Fellini, I love you know, the European filmmakers, black and white. I used to go to the film houses and I saw this image and pan or it just, the whole thing, it was just, I was inspired. And it was very French because you didn't see that in the States, especially in 1970, early seventies. Yeah. And Emily, could we advance two more slides, please? Um, oh, that one, yeah, exactly. So I, I wanted to kind of close on this image um, called Acid Rain from, uh, uh, there are other images in this series, Acid Rain, and Nicole, our assistant editor on this project, and I are both obsessed with this image. And I, in thinking of all the imagery that we witnessed um, this summer and um, the way that we're thinking about our lives in the city, now um, a lot of it is imagination because we're not on the streets. This image just struck me as so totally contemporary and mysterious and beautiful. And I just wondered if you could t share your thoughts about this image, Acid Rain, and what it means to you today and now that it's published in the book. Well, this was what, done in the 80s, early 80s, and climate, tra uh, climate change was the same thing as acid rain, at least back then, they were talking about the ozone. And it occurred to me with, you know, when I was shooting that in New York, everybody's here and this climate change, the whole entire world is being affected by, you know, the circumstances of, you know, the dying of our earth as we know it. and. Um, and this image to me looks like when I was in Africa, it looks like it could have been taken in Africa. Uh, and you know, I have other ones where there's an Asian and there's a young girl, but it says don't walk. It's just, you know, all those, like you were saying, feelings, they still apply today. Mm -hmm. Ming, there's one more question from the audience, which is um, you often paint on your images, um, sometimes hand coloring in some of the, for example, um, the image that was acquired by MoMA in 1970s, but more recently in your Transcendent series, um, doing a lot more paint. We don't have a slide of it, but I can show you in the book. Um, the question was, are you still continuing to paint on images? Um, and can you talk a little bit about why you want to mix uh, mediums like that. I'll find one while you are here. There's one right behind me. <laughs> oh, is it? There's one right oh. behind me. No, but I like that one better. Okay, no, this it's is one. Just the, it's the new. Oh, yeah. In the book. Right, yeah. 
That's upside down. Was it no, upside? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, let's see. So, yes, I still paint. I'm very much doing that more in the 2000s. Before, earlier, uh, I would use an image. I would kind of color certain things, like, say, a coloring book. Mm -hmm. But then, like, in 2000, and it was right before, yeah, it was around 2000. And, and uh, I started, I swear it was this spirit, one of the things that happened. And I started painting Mingus, it was Thanksgiving. I remember Thanksgiving 2007 and uh, 2000 and Mingus was away. It was Easter, it was Easter Sunday and he was always on a basketball tournament. He was always gone, he was always on tour. And I put these photographs up and I just started painting. And um, I usually paint when I'm by myself. I'm totally alone. I, for some reason, when anyone's in the house, I don't, I don't, I don't know why, but I just, I'm by myself when I paint. And the difference between 2000 and, and like the photograph that you painting or mixed media that you show is because before I colored, but now I use the image as a jumping off point. I, it, you know, I don't, uh, I paint over the image. I may add a line to go somewhere else. So it's more like it's mixed media, but the main difference is, whereas a painter starts with a blank canvas, I start with a photograph. And you know, um, poignantly, in your interview that, that you call it transcendence because you, it was about transcending those feelings um, from Columbus and from your, from your growing up. Yeah. Well, transcendence was specifically, um, I was listening to um, Alice Coltrane mm -hmm. and how she is, uh, you know, everyone used to always talk about uh, John Coltrane, but and I still, I, I play his music and I play her music. It's just like one thing to me. I don't separate John Coltrane there. She's just a continuation. It was like part of them were this one. They created this together. Even if he was in another room, she gave him space to create. She gave him, he, he could be himself. He could create. And, and that may seem you know, logical or of course, but it's not always that way because artists, they have a lot of different conflicts, especially with, you know, other people, and, you know, love relationships, children relationships. So transcendence was, I started out in Columbus, Jim Crow, just finishing Jim Crow. The people from Detroit would make fun of my father because when they went to the theater, they had to sit up top and and White would sit on the bottom. The Ku Klux Klan, one of the main headquarters, was in Columbus. And so transcendence was like, you know, my involvement, the world's just transcending. And her music, you know, was like, it's spiritual. And so, I, and my journey in my life has been like that. So that's one of my later paintings. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. Um, before we close, I just wanted to ask Easton and Amal if either of you had a question that you were burning to ask um, Ming now that you've you focused so long on your own contributions and then saw the book finally not too long ago. If there's a question from either of you. Well, Ming already answered my question about, about that Sun Ra concert, so. Um, I'm satisfied for now, but I will hit you up in Harlem sometime. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was like, to me, listening to Miles Davis, your words, like, were very music. I, lo I love the essay. It was very musical. Well, I guess my question would be, um, your work is so invested in dance and music. And I'm wondering that when you find the moment, right, so you... So you say that there's a, a moment when you, when you know that this is the picture. And I'm wondering if, 
if one of the reasons why you know it's the moment is related to the pacing and uh, choreography, cho choreography of of music and dance that you know this this is it. Is it is there any relationship between those things, perhaps? Oh yeah, I think so. It's it's like that in dance. It's you know what's what's the word writers have the perfect word but it's like all coming together like the movement the light the music you know your feelings what's happening and then there's that one moment and it just happens it's magic yeah. and i thank god whenever i get the image i just i just feel like you know i'm a vessel and i'm just doing god's work and that's so spirit and music and yeah. that's great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Ming. This has been such a privilege and a treat. And I think if we were all together, if the three of you were together on one stage, the star power would be such that we would all need a pair of sun rods. <laughs> so in lieu of that, um, I'm glad we could commune across multiple time zones. And I hope that everyone out there will find their way to this beautiful book. And Alexandra, um, I turn it over to you and with our thanks on behalf of Aperture again for um, this collaboration with Cam. Thank you, Brendan. Absolutely. I mean, I couldn't have um, spent my Thursday evening with a more incredible, uh, brilliant group of scholars and artists. And I know that our public here at CAM feels the same way. Um, there was a comment in the question and answer that says how excellent the program is and says to me, can you please just continue working? And um, for me, the big takeaway with that comment is, you know, that may we all be inspired by the beauty, power, and grace of Ming's life and her work. Um, and we all continue to, to carry on the spirit. Um, of course, as Brenda mentioned, please do purchase a copy of the book. Um, again, via SOM Books here in Los Angeles, if you're here, if you're in New York, um, I believe you can purchase it via Aperture Online or, or elsewhere. Um, and everybody have a great evening. We look forward to welcoming you back to CAM. Hopefully sooner than later, stay safe, stay healthy, stay well, and stay blessed. And thank you all again for your time and your contributions this evening. Have a great evening and thank you again to Aperture for being such lovely partners. We love working with you all and we appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you all. Good night, Mimi. Great night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. <laughs>